This is a special presentation of Farm Journal Television. You're locked in to Corn College TV. I'm Clinton Griffiths. Here's what's coming up. Today, our experts are putting it all together. Take a step back and ponder the big picture. That's today on Corn College TV. Welcome to Corn College TV with field agronomist Ken Ferry, associate field agronomist Missy Bauer, Farm Journal's Margie Fisher, and host Clinton Griffiths. Step back, take a deep breath, and relax. The combine is put away, the tillage is done, and winter is quickly approaching. The end of the season is a great time to reflect on what just happened. That's why in today's systems approach, we're taking a minute to look at the big picture, putting it all on the table in preparation for next year. Missy, we've been talking all year about the systems approach, and there's a lot of pieces to that puzzle, uh, and it involves many things. Yeah, the system approach has so many components to it. And, you know, we go from everything like soil testing and fertility, pest management, hybrid selection, tillage. <laughs> so know. many different pieces to that. Puzzle, that's right? right. That's right. So we want to make sure that people understand and, and start to manage truly in a systems approach fashion. So breaking things up, looking at it in a big picture. Uh, but yet segmenting those out into smaller pieces. And I guess it's a good idea not to focus on just one of those throughout the year. You really need to look at all of them. Right. What we see a lot of times is that people might all of a sudden focus really heavy on one thing out of their system while something else slides. Mm -hmm. So maybe I'm doing really good with my tillage practice, but my planner wasn't set up right or something like that. So we see where if a guy gets too focused on one side of it, something else in that system slips. So we really need to do a good job on making sure we're looking at everything that's involved in the systems approach and not just focus on that one thing. Right, and with so many components, it's hard to say that you're gonna do all of that by yourself. I mean, there's so much to do, and especially certain times of the year, I mean, you're running as fast as you can. That probably means getting some help. Yeah, we need to make sure that we got to bring in people when we need people. So this systems approach is certainly not something that we feel like we have to do on our own. Um, so think about what are the things that you can delegate. Maybe you got some things that a hired man can kind of be in charge of for your systems approach. You know, maybe they're going to be in charge of pest management or the scouting side of it. Or maybe you're going to hire some things done, an outside consultant or an independent consultant that can help you with things as well. Or maybe your fertilizer dealer is going to do your spreading. So there's a right. lot of things that you can do, and you really need to sit down and decide, you know, what are some of the things I can do myself versus delegate or hire done and surround yourself with what I call the good team and make sure that you've got a good team of people involved to get you to your systems approach. If you think you're going to do it all yourself, it's probably not practical. Yeah, and probably one of the best ways to find out how you did on a year is to step back and review and constantly keep reviewing and say, how are we doing on all of these different components? It's very important to review your, your system and your agronomic practices. You know, you know, what did you actually do and how did it turn out? Whether it's looking through our yield maps and data later on or if it's actually out in the field, how well did I plant the corn, what is my ear count, just constantly doing that review so we can keep ourselves in check. Yeah, and, and probably seeing if there's anything new out there that you need to incorporate for the next year. That's right. We really got to keep up with the, the what I would call continual or a constant improvement because what we're doing today we think might be good, yeah. but if we're still doing that same thing five years from now and there's nothing different, then all of a sudden we're probably our lagging behind. So we need to strive for that continual improvement. Keep finding things in your system's approach that we can fine tune, tweak, and just get a little bit better. And keep in mind, just because maybe today you feel like you are doing everything yeah. right, that might not be the case if you don't make changes a little bit each year. The next thing you know, you will be behind. Yeah, you can get behind and it can all snowball on you. Bottom line, the systems approach is just a way to be able to look at your operation and break it down for you uh, so you can keep doing this job. Yeah, we want to take the, the kind of what I call the end goal of all this, you know, to look at the big picture of it. With our systems approach, our goal is going to be to improve yield and profitability at the end of the day. And if we can take a look at it in that aspect, I think we can do a lot better job. We're back in the field with a few tips for preparing next year's seed bed. And later, get dusted with the details of lime when Corn College TV continues. Corn College TV is brought to you by DeKalb. For all season strong performance and results you can take to the bin. Go with DeKalb.
the brand that gets results with strong roots and strong stocks for performance you can take to the bin. Go with industry-leading DeKalb Genetics and proven Genuity Trait Technology, letting you get more from every acre. Go all season strong. Go with DeKalb. Get your crops off to a great start. Use Season Pass with Avail, your ticket to higher yields. Season Pass, a low salt starter, is non-corrosive, includes zinc, low application rates, available NPK row starter, and includes Avail technology. With as little as three to five gallons per acre, Season Pass can be applied in furrow, saving precious planting time while maximizing your yields. To get your growing season off to a great start, contact Darren Blank at 812-455-4911. When you're missing nitrogen, you're missing a lot. On average, more than 30% of soil applied nitrogen simply disappears. Yet study after study shows that Agritain nitrogen stabilizers yield more. In 2008, 15 to 25 bushels per acre more in corn alone for just pennies per pound. Control nitrogen loss now with Agritain and get back what you're missing. Ask your retailer about Agritain or Agritain Plus. Hello folks, this is Mark Gold with Top 3rd Ag Marketing. If you need help marketing your grains or livestock, give us a call. We offer one-on-one -on -one relationships that can protect you without the threat of margin costs. We don't speculate, we manage risk. If you're tired of paying acreage and management fees for marketing advice that hasn't actually helped your bottom line, then give us a call. Call today to get two weeks of Mark's private grain marketing email. Top 3rd Ag Marketing, earning the trust of American farmers every day. Well, before you get too comfortable and put all of your tools away, there are a few things every producer can do in preparation for next year. Missy Bauer heads to the field for a look at her favorite field prep tips. Today, as we head to the field, we want to talk about some things for field prep for next season. What are some things we need to be thinking ahead about uh, for, for this next crop season? So some things to start with are going to be any fall herbicide applications. It's been a very warm fall here and it seems like the weeds have really gotten a good start. So maybe we need to think about doing some burn downs to try to reduce the amount of weed pressure we're gonna have here next spring. So, you know, things like dandelion, like we have down here, uh, we can have a much better ability to kill those in the fall versus in the spring. So trying to control some of these annual or winter annual weeds as well as some of these perennials that get difficult in other times of the years to do. So that's one thing I really think we need to consider. You know, this chickweed is another one that can really become a carpet and we can have issues trying to kill that in the spring as well. So let's control some of these weeds in the fall with some burn down applications. The second thing I think we need to think about for field prep for next year, of course, is gonna get our fertilizer and lime on. When we have a nice dry fall, it gives us an opportunity to get all that work done. Some things we wanna think about with that are Make sure we're following our soil test. So let our soil test determine the recommendations as far as how much lime or how much fertilizer actually needs applied to these fields. And then just think about how good of a job are you doing with your uniformity of spreading those materials. So has your truck been pan tested or calibrated to see if we're spreading uniform across the width of the truck? If you've got an 80 foot or a 90 foot spread on fertilizer, is that actually what we're doing uniformly across the back of it? So how rough or smooth is your field? You know, the rougher the field, the more difficult time we're gonna have with good uniform applications of our lime as well as that fertilizer. And let's also remember what our past was. So we know that the fall of 2009 was very wet. There was a lot of ruts and wheel tracks made when we took corn out. So this particular field here had corn on it in 2009. Uh, very little tillage done uh, in 2010 as far as we more filled in the tracks or filled in those wheel tracks but we didn't do any actual deep aggressive tillage to take out the bottom of those compaction layers. So remember which fields you had struggled with in the fall of 2009 we have an opportunity this year to get in there and make some corrections get rid of some of that deep compaction let's go ahead and get that done in preparation for next year. And of course just tillage in general uh, when we're doing tillage, we want to make sure that we're doing proper tillage. We want to be paying attention to the depth and do some digging behind these machines to make sure uh, that, that we're at the proper depth based on wherever our, our density layers are at. So we're tilling kind of for a purpose. Are we tilling more shallow versus deep? And that's all going to be based on what we see happening underground 
where we've got density layers at, old plow soils, or issues that we're dealing with there. Where are those compaction uh, layers at? So make sure we're doing our tillage at, at the proper depth, as well as leaving it pretty smooth or level behind it. We don't want to have a, a mess come spring where we've got high ridges or peaks where we've got uh, valleys and, and peaks out there where we've got wet soil versus the dry soil and all of a sudden we blend it together and plant into that mixture of soil moisture. We want uniform soil moisture. So as we can see here in the background, we're trying to leave this pretty level in the fall as we go through with that primary tillage tool. And of course, another big thing, our final thing for getting ready for next year is after harvest is done here and we get some time to get back in the office, start looking through all of our yield maps and really analyzing our hybrids. Were there certain hybrids that performed a lot better than others to be able to make these hybrid selections for next year? So spending some time in the office, what hybrids did, uh, did well under certain soil types and certain conditions and try to make those uh, assessments or recommendations for next year. So just some things to think about to get us ready and kind of some field preparations for next season. Corn College TV is brought to you by Avail. Avail this fall helps get your crop off to a good start. Next stop to higher yield potential, your crop. Visit www.sfp.com for more information. It's a painful fact that up to 75 to 95% of your phosphorus never reaches your crop. That's why there's Avail Phosphorus Fertilizer Enhancer, a proven technology that protects your phosphorus fertilizer from locking into the soil. Treating your fall applied phosphorus with Avail will give your crop the nutrients they need in the spring and you the peace of mind knowing your fertilizer will be available to your crop when it needs it. See the difference for yourself. Visit chooseavail.com or give them a call, 888-446-GROW. It's a good tool to have and it's very simple. It's real easy when the ride fence if the limbs fell down to take this kit, which I just keep it on the saddle. When you come by a loose wire, you grab this thing out of your tractor and tighten it up. You, you can tighten it and be back in the tractor about as fast as you can open a gate. We're simply gonna open up one side of the jaw lock it on, open up the other side, and we're going to turn our body sideways. Now, the tighter I pull it, the tighter the fence stays. We're going to lay it across the face of the tool. We're going to take a nice short wrap on this side. We're going to come over here. We're going to take a nice short wrap on this side like this. So use your fencing pliers and simply weave it right back into the fence where you took it out of. Now, if you'll notice, that fence is just nice and bowstring tight, just like we wanted it to be when we started out. Order the original Texas Fence Fixer today for just $89.95 plus shipping and handling. Or get the kit. Includes fencing pliers, steerskin gloves, the original Texas Fence Fixer and carry bag for only $139.95 plus shipping and handling. Call or order online today. Rust is destroying your valuable equipment and property. Rust Guy permanently stops rust the easy way. No scraping, grinding, or sandblasting. Brush, spray, or roll Rust Guy onto any rusted metal and it will not rust again. Rust Guy is not a paint, but an industrial strength formula that kills rust on contact. It leaves a smooth finish that can be left as is or painted. Rust Guy protects from salt, manure, fertilizer, urine, and rain. Call 888 Rust Guy to talk to a rust expert or go to rustguy.com. Most of us know about the importance of lime for its pH balancing properties, but lime is not lime is not lime. Quality control is the key to maximizing the investment. Ken Ferry opens today's Farmer's Toolbox with a lesson on the importance of buying from the right source. One of the foundation pieces in a system's pyramid is the soil pH that gets into the soil fertility. We get a lot of questions about limestone and, and, and the value of limestone, one quarry over the other, and there may be as much as a three or four dollar a ton difference uh, when a lime gets spread in the field itself. And grows. So what's that lime worth? And when we talk about the value of limestone, we, we look in two areas mainly, and one is the purity of the rock itself. So how much uh, neutralizing value does the actual limestone have? That's something that has to be done in a laboratory. You have to send it away and get an analysis done on it. And they know how much calcium carbonate can neutralize. So they always make a comparison off of a product that is 100% calcium carbonate and they'll compare your limestone to that. So if your limestone has the neutralizing value that's 85% of what 100% calcium carbonate would be, you're gonna have an 85% calcium carbonate. 
There's a lot of different things in limestone that can cause it uh, or can give it neutralizing capabilities. So it could range as low as something like fly ash, around 40% calcium carbonate, as high as a burnt ash that, or burnt limestone that could have 175% calcium carbonate. So it depends on the lime source. But first you've got to have the quality of your lime and then the fineness of the lime. The finer the limestone, the more surface area that you have, the more neutralizing power you're going to have because you come in contact with more acidity. So the fineness of the grind. So to get the fineness of the grind, we have to put the lime through a set of sieves. And these sieves have different size meshes. And these meshes <clears throat> uh, are designed to, to separate out the aggregate into different uh, sizes. So I got a base sample here. Um, but there's no way of knowing what the actual uh, sieve analysis are going to be until we put it through a sieve. And we shake it down through an 8 and a 30 and a 60, and then some stays in the pan. So we go from the coarse material that stays above an 8, and we go all the way down to the fine material that stays in the pan. This is where your neutralizing power comes from, the stuff that's in the, uh, in the pan itself, and the stuff that passes through a 60 mesh screen. So we take those, each one of these aggregate sizes has a neutralizing efficiency factor and we add those up and we come up with the efficiency factor based on the fineness of the grind. That is multiplied then against the calcium carbonate equivalent to come up with total neutralizing value. So we'll know what the neutralizing value of a limestone is. So here in Illinois for instance it's about 46 percent. So if I needed a the neutralizing value of a thousand pounds of calcium carbonate, I'm going to have to put on about a ton of limestone to get that thousand pounds. So we can definitely tell the value of the lime, but the other thing is then the spreadability of the lime. And if we look at it, it's this coarser material that gives us good spread. And if we don't have any of this in here, it gets trickier to spread on windier days and the truck has to be adjusted to spread fine lime. And in some cases, it may be just impossible to do because the wind's blowing above 10 mile an hour. So we have to look for some coarse material to get spreadability, but we've got to have the fine material to get neutralizing value. You can, in some cases, in the state of Illinois, for instance, the state publishes what the quality of the limestone is. And you can get this on the internet, and it'll tell you um, what the fineness grades are and <clears throat> give you what percent of magnesium is also in that. From here, it gives you a correction value. And that correction value could be anywhere from a 0.5 to a 1.5. If it's a 0.5, it says that you only have to put on a half a ton when you need one ton. And if it's a 1.5, you're going to have to put on one and a half ton when you need a ton because it's a coarser material or the lime quality is not there. We sifted these out and looked at the original cost. And the original cost here of the first sample is $26, $18, $28, $31, 24 and when we actually uh, look at the neutralizing value of this, we realize that the costs are quite a bit different. In this case, the best buy for the money actually is right here at $28. And the reason for it is, is this is the neutralizing part right here. This is the spreadability part right here. So it has a considerably higher neutralizing value than the limestone right next to it that has quite a bit less. We could spread this in windy days, but our neutralizing value here would not be very good. So again, you have to look at quality of the rock, the efficiency of the grind, and the spreadability of that product. It's going to be a big part of picking the right lime source for your farm. Spreadability is, is definitely got to be something we, we worry about. We have to put limestone on like paint. We have to have uniform surface cover. We can spread manure uh, and not put it on as at, put it on like paint and the corn is okay because the root system grows to the nutrient. This case though with limestone we're neutralizing the soil. So think of it like painting the field. We have to put it on very uniform. This product here is a good product. It's very fine limestone. It's almost talcum powder. has high neutralizing capabilities. It's a municipal lime that comes out of a water treatment facility. The problem is the price is right as well because it's free. But the farmers uh, take this limestone and try to apply it with a manure spreader. And that application is very poor for neutralizing limestone because we end up with these large chunks out in the field and underneath this chunk we're going to drive pHs to a micro environment probably up close to an 8 or higher. Good lime but it needs to be processed. It needs to be reground, put back down into a powder, turned into a slurry and sprayed on 
or a truck that is calibrated for this fine lime to spread it. But spreading this with a manure spreader is, is not a good practice. In today's Ask an Agronomist, we continue our look at lime. A viewer wants to know, can I spread fertilizer and lime at the same time? When we think about applying fertilizer and lime on the same day, it's going to depend on what fertilizer we're applying. So if we're just applying potash, we have no concerns about that. But if we're going to look at applying phosphorus and lime on the same day, that's where we start to have our concerns. The phosphorus is actually chemically a negative charge. When we apply lime, which has calcium and magnesium in it, we have the opportunity for that fixation. So those being positive charge ions versus the negative, they'll actually uh, bind together and be fixed. So we do not want to apply calcium, lime, or dolomitic lime with phosphorus in, the, in that same day. What we'd like to have happen is actually a rain in between uh, or something to get it hydrolyzed. And once it's hydrolyzed, if these granules are broke down, in other words, if you go out to your field and take a look on the ground, if you can no longer see the granules, then we know we're okay to go ahead and put the lime on. A few other things to keep in mind is the finer the lime, the bigger the risk because it's going to be more reactive versus a coarse lime. And the second thing is residue. The heavier residue cover we have would reduce the risk of this problem or fixation as well just because we're not going to have as much contact with these two materials together. So ideal situation, don't apply your phosphorus and lime in the same day. Maybe do the phosphorus first because it will hydrolyze quicker, then come back after a rain or after a heavy dew and get your lime on. Next on Corn College TV, proper tillage is important to maximizing root growth, but does your equipment have what it takes to till at the depth your farm needs? Ken Ferry and Margie Fisher sort it out next on Corn College TV. Corn College TV is brought to you by the Andersons, producers of Season Pass with a Veil, your in corn starter. Season Pass with a Veil, your ticket to higher yields. gets results with strong roots and strong stocks for performance you can take to the bin. Go with industry-leading DeKalb Genetics and proven Genuity Trait Technology, letting you get more from every acre. Go, Go all season strong. Go with DeKalb. Mark your calendar. Ag Connect Expo 2011 is coming to Atlanta, Georgia on January 7th through the 10th. Connect with experts. Learn new ideas, new technology. Connect to the future of agriculture, the newest innovations. Connect globally with producers from around the world. This show sets itself apart from the regional shows. Ag Connect Expo 2011, where the world of agriculture comes together. I've traveled around the world a lot. I've witnessed uh, what we're trying to address here, and that's hunger. There's six billion people on the face of the planet today, and they say there's over a billion of them that have poor nutrition. They go to bed hungry. And I come back home and I witness the incredible productivity that takes place in American agriculture across our country. Somehow, we need to do a better job of getting the food to those people that are in need. I guess when I look at Farmers Feeding the World, I say to myself, what do we really hope to accomplish? I hope we accomplish a design of a system that has a legacy that goes on for multiple generations. And I think with the knowledge that is possessed within agriculture, the funding that is in, within agriculture, we can get this accomplished. Farmers Feeding the World is about agriculture coming together to increase both hunger solutions and food production. Learn more, give generously, dream huge. Ken, before a farmer makes a pass with a tillage tool, they really need to have a goal for what's going on out in that field. Tell me a little bit about how they should figure out what they need to accomplish with each tillage pass. Yeah, tillage course consists of everything from shank width, the depth of machine, horsepower needed, that type of thing. And most definitely when a grower would call me and he said, I'm interested in this piece of equipment, what do you think? You have to go back and say, what are you attempting to do or what are you trying to do? And it could be completely different. For one guy, he maybe just want to lift the soil and, and, and uh, shatter it uh, for better root penetration. The next guy may be trying to take out old plow soles or hard pans or something like that. 
So the first thing they have to do is get to work underneath the ground, figure out what they're trying to do, what they're trying to accomplish. And if they got a, you know, an eight inch plow sole, they're gonna have to go nine or 10 inches deep, get below that, and that tool's gonna have to be able to handle that and be able to take it out. Then they're gonna have to have enough horsepower on the front end, of course, to pull it. And, and this particular field here today, for instance, there's no real serious problem that we're working with. And we can tell that by looking at the fossils left in this field from last year. So as we're tilling these root systems up, these are what we'd call a, a phenomenal chassis system underneath this plant. There's real no sign that we have layers or anything like that that we have to take out. But we're trying to set this up for another successful year, in this case of corn on corn. So this is in a vertical tillage format for this grower. So he has to do uh, enough shattering below ground to make sure he gets full shatter across the surface. So when he brings in his vertical till tool this spring to level this up, he doesn't have hard mounds under here that aren't tilled that are gonna give him fits. Unlike a, uh, somebody farming in a horizontal format that would take a disc or a soil finisher in here, they would shear off some of those untilled areas. So in this case, we have to go deep enough to get that done. We're on 24 inch centers with our shanks here. So that means we have to run this tool about 12 inches deep to get that kind of surface shatter. And that surface shatter across here is really excellent. As we look at this, I can take my knife and I can come in here and I can tell that this has all been fractured all the way across. He's got six to eight inches of good fracture all the way across between the shanks. He's got good incorporation of his residue, so decomposition is gonna be well underway here in a short amount of time. And we can come into this field next spring and level this off without any hard columns in here that are gonna give him fits with this corn planter. So we are accomplishing what we need to do with this machine. Um, doesn't always have to be deep tillage to do what we're doing here. In this case, we're running 12 inches deep and that's, that's more than adequate for this problem. If I had a nine or 10 inch plow sole in here, this probably would not be the tool. It probably wouldn't go deep enough to take to take that plow sole out or at least take it out in, in one step like we're, we would try to do if we had it here. So you talked about dealing with compaction layers, managing soil density, but also crop rotation. What specific challenges come with a corn on corn rotation? The corn on corn rotation is, is one of the biggest challenges is the residue itself because it puts huge demands on our nitrogen program as well as, as, uh, as this old corn plant decomposes, it gives off toxins, and those toxins are hard on next year's crop. So the more incorporation that we can do, the faster it will decompose, the less disease will carry over into next year, and the less toxins that we have to deal with. Not saying that you can't no-till corn into corn stalks, but it's a lot easier if we do some type of tillage, such as strip till, or in this case, chisel plowing it under, with leaving enough residue on top to kind of conserve the soil so we don't have wind erosion issues and stuff like that. But at the same time, it has to be a uniform fracture if we want uniform growth and development in the spring. And going deep, fracturing uniformly, and burying all that residue does demand a little bit more horsepower than some farmers may be used to. How can they be sure they have enough tractor to pull some of these new style tools? Well, I, you know, my biggest uh, suggestion would be try them before you buy them. Uh, take them out, hook them onto your tractor, make sure you've got enough horsepower and traction to do the job to get it done. And deep tillage for one grower is not always the same. In some of the soils, deep tillage is seven, eight, nine inches deep. While in some of the soils like we're in here, deep tillage could be 14 or 15 inches deep. Hey, thanks for spending time with us here on Corn College TV. As always, we hope you're getting quality information out of each and every show. Remember, if you miss an episode, we're putting them all online, so go to the website or pass the information on to someone else you know so they can get educated. Thanks for watching. Class dismissed. Corn College TV is produced and distributed by Farm Journal Television.